I really appreciate it. Is this thing on? I don't know. Uh, I think my mom's watching. That makes me happy. I saw my little brother in the chat. Um, everyone, I'm Mike Grinberg. I'm the CEO of the RevOps shop. Uh, we help companies win more business more often. Uh, we work on CRMs. We help you get better with cold email. Uh, really happy to be here um, on behalf of Aircall and Sales Hacker. A um, little bit about me, you know, I guess where am I from? Uh, born, uh, kind of raised in New York City, uh, went to HubSpot, uh, started my professional sales career there, uh, had a great six-year run, uh, it was amazing, uh, learned a lot there. Uh, now I'm running my own business with my partner, Steve Ferrari. Um, he's on this call too. And yeah, really, really passionate about uh, helping salespeople get better at their jobs. Spent a lot of my time at HubSpot doing that. Um, yeah, and excited about the content today. I know that this is kind of a, a tough time for a lot of us uh, salespeople. Uh, it tends to be really, really stressful. The goal of today is uh, to give you all some uh, ways to make it feel like you're not uh, pressuring your prospects too much. It's to make it feel like, hey, you know, it's still a pleasure to do business with you. It's to create some urgency without uh, dropping a lot of discounts, which we all know we're going to do at some point this quarter anyway. So no templates on that. Uh, we're going to be giving, uh, we're going to give you, we're going to give you a lot of content that you're going to like otherwise. Um, and yeah, and I think we're, we're good to get rolling. Um, I really don't like talking about myself too much. I'd rather just kind of talk about what's going to help everybody. So with that being said, uh, let's see if this thing actually works. Um, let's share this window. And now I'm I don't think it would really be uh, a technology uh, demo or conversation if tools just worked, but there we go. Um, so yeah, I'm sticking your Q4 deals. Um, my sales manager's breathing down my neck. Uh, I've probably spent a lot of time working my territory, working my accounts. What do I mean by that? I've been sending lots of emails, lots of calls. Um, I've been trying to reach out to people, get them interested in my product or service or my solution. Um, how do we go ahead and unstick some of these deals? Again, thanks to Aircall, Sales Hacker, um, and the RevOps shop. Let's kind of talk about how we make this happen. Uh, where does the rubber meet the road? So first thing is you need to be able to, uh, and, and I'll get to this in a little bit, you need to be able to see all of your deals in order to unstick them. So the first thing is must-haves in the Q4 deal view. You had a lot of conversations this year. Um, I'm going to show you how to surface them, even if they're not in, even if they're not in a CRM. Uh, number two, a live example. We're actually going to dive into uh, my deal view uh, that I've created specifically for this call. We'll kind of talk about that. Uh, three templates to help you save Q4. Um, in the chat, type in one if you're chasing President's Club, two if you're trying to get off of a performance plan, or three if you're just here for fun. Um, let's see some of those. All right, sweet. Lots of threes, lots of ones. No one wants to admit that they're on plan like me. That's okay. Okay, there we go. Steve's on plan. Uh, he's probably just joking. All right, great. Uh, thanks for par participating, everybody. Uh, then after that, uh, after we get through the templates, um, we'll kind of just get into the, the meat and potatoes there. I think we'll all have a great time dissecting them. I'll kind of take questions as we go along in the chat. And then uh, the recap and the Q&A. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Let's get rolling. So this was kind of the first point I made. Uh, you want to be able to see your deals in one place. Um, you've got a, you know, you've got Rick in the pick and he, uh, sales manager Rick is a, uh, got sticky hands because he's got sticky deals and his team has sticky deals. Um, if you can't see them, you can't unstick them. That's really the point. So all of us in sales today, uh, maybe another fun one for the chat, uh, drop, uh, put a one in the chat. If you have a CRM, put a two um, if you're using Google Sheets and three if you're using Post-it notes. Wow, look at that, a bunch of technology. Uh, oh, look at that, we've got Post-it notes, one, two, and three. We like the honesty. Um, I still fall on post-it notes sometimes too. So I'm a one and three person myself. Sweet. Yep. Um, so what do we need to kind of be able to see them? 
I'm going to skip the CRM stuff. This, I want everybody to pay attention to this part specifically. Um, you know, as, as I was kind of putting this deck together and putting a lot of the content together, this is something that really stood out to me. So there's going to be some of you that are in the chat right now, some, some of you that are on the webinar, chances are you've either A, like taken over a territory um, at some point this year, uh, or you've been prospecting this entire year. Um, this is kind of a top tip. This is something I, I really recommend you do. Um, especially if the database or the list of contacts that you're working is not something that you developed completely by yourself. Um, so I would go ahead and search your emails for the word contract, uh, the word proposal, the word quote, the word pricing, the word MSA, the word NDA or legal. Um, another good one could be everybody in sales favorite word or least favorite word, which is discount. Um, those would all be great things to search for why. Um, because a lot of times, if you're not logging things in your CRM, if you lose your post-it notes, if your dog eats them, um, if Google Sheets decides to have a meltdown, uh, in any of those scenarios, you're going to want to surface up the relevant conversations. I mean, we're only human, right? If you read a lot of the stuff on LinkedIn, you'll, you'll probably think, oh, we're all superheroes that could do 550 activities a day. But we're human. We forget things. It happens. Go into your email inbox. Type in all of these words. Um, you know, you use the quotation marks around each term, um, and then you do the or so you can actually copy that text and you'll be able to see all those emails that come up. Uh, the bottom one's also a personal favorite. If you took over a territory, think about this, and, and you could also kind of think about uh, how emails themselves are managed at companies. If you're taking over a territory, I, if I'm taking over a territory, I'm reaching out to my manager um, and I'm working with the IT team. Uh, to figure out what the previous email alias of the rep was that had the territory before me. And I'm running that same search because people could have had conversations before you um, that you don't know about, especially if that information is not necessarily being logged in your CRM. Even if it is, we know what it's like uh, clicking that show more button, show more activities 150 times. Um, it's a big pain. I think the question is going to be what kind of format do you want those emails handed over to you in? I think especially because we're at the beginning of Q4, this could be a really worthwhile exercise, um, especially as you kind of think about closed loss campaigns and uh, ways to wake up and revive existing deals. Uh, this is something that I really just can't harp on this enough. I feel like this will help you all out a lot. Um, Anybody in the chat, just maybe yes or no, has anyone ever done anything like this? Is this something that, you know, for those of you that are not in your first year of sales, this is this a play you've ran before? Just type in yes or no. Uh, we got a yes from Jamal. That's great. Anybody take over an existing, anybody take over an existing territory? Um, do we have any of those people in the chat? Or maybe somebody worked before them? Yeah, I think that one, this one, we kind of wanted to, to aim at, at that group. So now let's go ahead and uh, let's go to the uh, next slide. So um, what makes a great Q4 deal view, right? So now you know how to dig up some old deals. Um, again, checking your email inbox. Um, if you haven't had that territory the entire time, if you know that list of accounts has been worked by other people, definitely reach out to IT and your manager and try to get that same search ran. Um, now let's let's go ahead and let's move on to the bare minimum, the kind of table stakes. So you want to have the name of your deal. Um, everybody has different naming conventions, so we're just going to kind of breeze right past that. What's the company that's tied to this deal? Um, who's the primary point of contact? Who are the associated contacts? I think that's really the bare minimum um, to be able to see this. Um, now let's you know to be great. Um, we talk about the close date being filtered to the next six months. Why do we care about the next six months? Um, I think that answer is going to be straightforward for a lot of you, um, especially if people have seen kind of the advanced technique, like working uh, with their IT team to, to find out a previous reps, kind of discount emails and whatnot. I think the close date filtered to the next six months, what are the deals that are out there for January, February, March, people that said not this year, not this time. Uh, if, if you're keeping accurate records, um, that would be kind of where I'd stop. Um, I think you're also going to need to hold yourself accountable to a next step and a date when you're actually going to do it. And you're going to see this come through in a lot of the templates that I'm going to show in a little bit, um, as well as the entire deal team. So I think 
uh, just based on some of the people in the chat and, and people that have reached out to me on LinkedIn before this webinar, um, I, I think there's been a good healthy mix of people that are selling kind of more complicated solution as well as people that have a little bit of a transactional sale. Um, so we'll kind of talk about the deal team guidance and, and what that means. I think uh, you get a lot further in sales when you're working with other people, especially if people aren't responding to you. Um, and that's going to be a lot of the focus um, in the webinar and the content today. Um, so that's really what makes a great Q4 um, deal view. So now we're going to show you um, here we have our Kitty Academy of salespeople, and they are going to go ahead and use HubSpot and Aircall to unstick their deals. And now let's kind of talk about um, what that actually looks like. So I'm just going to move my tab, confirm that everybody's seeing this. I, I know I'm using a big monitor. Not everybody has the same screen. Does everybody feel like this is a little too crunch? Uh, maybe just any feedback in the chat would be helpful before I get started. Sweet. Um, see, I think all of us will be using uh, different CRMs on the call. Um, that's totally fine. I, I choose to use HubSpot. Of course, I'm biased. I worked there for six years, but um, this is just something that really works for me. If we go back to the uh, previous slide that we had looked at, and I'm not actually, I'm not actually going to do it, but you, here you see um, the deal name is going to be the first column. Uh, don't get too distracted by all the buttons everywhere. I know our eyes tend to glaze over sometimes. Just pay attention to the deal name. Here's the company. Here's the contact. I'm going to have the deal stage, the amount. Um, and then I'm going to have, so what I have, like an I have an executive sponsor and then a technical sales owner. That's what I refer to as my deal team. We'll get into that a little bit, but the I, th I don't think I need to explain any of the first five or six columns. The executive sponsor is the person that works at my company that can help me sell a deal. Um, and then the technical sales owner is going to be, for those of you that are in technology, that's going to be your sales engineer, your solutions engineer, or solutions architect. Uh, if you're in a different industry that's not, um, you know, and I know some of these webinars, we tend to kind of lean on software and services. If you're in a different industry, this could be someone that works in, in the warehouse, uh, someone on the operations side, anybody that's in the production uh, of a physical good. Um, those will be good people that can speak the language on a more technical level that will bring a dimension to your sales process that is not uh, just someone that reeks of commission breath. And whether we like it or not, that's the perception of us sometimes. And, and our goal is to figure out how to challenge it in a meaningful way. Uh, then after that, I have the next step. I have the next step date. Um, and then I have my close date. We see all of those being in the future. So what is the first thing I'm going to do? So in order for me to unstick my deals, and I realize some of you are not going to have six or seven. You might have 35. You might have 40. Uh, you might have you might have tons of opportunities. I think the point of this exercise, if you're going to walk away from this with one takeaway, it's first you want to of course prioritize by deal amount. But on top of that, you also want to understand: Do I have anybody involved that's an executive that can help me? Have I done what I need to do to alert people? And when I say executive, it could just be anybody more senior than you. Uh, I think you, everybody here, if you haven't tried this, I, I really recommend it. I know that I got a lot of, I got a lot of guidance on this uh, when I worked at HubSpot. It's something that helped me out a lot. Um, you think you can do it all yourself, and that's part of what we, I think we all aspire to that as salespeople, but a lot of times there's a lot of power in bringing in other people that can bring a different perspective and also connect with your prospects in a way that maybe you can't. Um, and there's nothing wrong. Um, with admitting that, admitting that, and there's nothing wrong with trying that. Next step, we have the technical sales owner. So in this case, before I just kind of start aimlessly, you know, clicking around, for example, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to look at this deal, Lead Magic. Now, uh, all of you great salespeople that are on this webinar, you all probably know your prospect. You know the companies that they work for. Like when you're able to actually visualize them in a table that looks like this, you could probably go ahead and say, oh, this is the lead magic conversation that I'm having. Now for me, I like to put in some of the core products that I'm working on into the deal name. Okay, so this is the HubSpot quoting and CPQ module. Um, and then after that, I know that it's with Jesse. So I might go ahead and think about, okay, what conversations have I had with Jesse? Again, even if I'm not using HubSpot, right? Just at the most primitive level, 
Um, and where did I get stuck, right? That's being really honest with yourself. Where did I get stuck? What did I miss? What were the things that Jesse talked about? Or maybe what were the things that Jesse didn't talk about that I really need Jesse to talk about in order for me to understand how to advance this deal, how to unstick it. Uh, so for me, I'm going to say maybe I'm not the best person uh, to talk to Jesse and maybe uh, you ended off on kind of the wrong foot, right? And that's why uh, this deal is still stuck. Um, that's why you haven't closed it. It's set to, you know, it's set that it's going to close at the end of this month and you don't even have a next step. You don't have a next step date. So for me, in this case, I might say, uh, so in this case, I might say, um, remind, uh, so this one will be like, remind Jesse of the cost of his data problem, right? Um, data problem. And I'll just say something like use template one and I'll kind of provide some of those references in a second. Uh, and then when do I want this done by? That's my next step date field. I want this done by tomorrow. I'm gonna to do this today. Um, then I'm gonna go ahead and hit save. So basically the idea is, okay, do I need a technical sales owner? I've got an executive here. I feel like Jesse is pretty savvy uh, here from a, you know, a technical perspective. So maybe we don't need both, um, but I do want someone to help me co-sell this. Whereas for this Syngene kind of email deliverability deal, where I'm doing a little bit more work, it's a little bit more technically involved. And I know that Harry, who is my decision maker, has a lot of questions around how does this work within our existing infrastructure? In that case, I might go ahead and get my chief architect. And you know, I want Steve on the call because he's going to be the person that's going to help out. So the idea is just going through this exercise is going to give you a lot of clarity. I always advise people, and I really try to do this myself, don't rush it. Um, you don't have to. It's still early enough where if you take action on this today um, and you create a plan that you're going to commit to executing on next week, um, you're still going to have plenty of time for conversation. Uh, I know that probably uh, sales managers and, and VPs of revenue don't want to hear that. I think it's just, again, holding yourself accountable. So I went ahead. I've done that. Now, for the sake of the demo and for the sake of the example, we don't want to spend time on this page you know, for, for basically the rest of the time. Now the question is gonna be, all right, I've added some next steps. Um, I've added some next steps. I've added a next step date. I have that put in here. I've identified who I want on my deal team. Now the next question is gonna be like, how do I go ahead and actually work these, right? So again, if you're using a lot of different tools, in my case, again, I'm gonna use HubSpot. I'm gonna use AirCall to call and email my prospects. I'm gonna show you how I do that. I hit the checkbox up here in the top left-hand corner. Then after that, I'm gonna go ahead and hit this create tasks button, which I've already done. Once I go ahead and I do that, I've got my tasks, I've got them ready to roll, and then I just start all six of them. Um, and then I'm instantly gonna get tossed into kind of the workflow. Now those properties that I had kind of identified, I know that for, let's say like for Jesse, I wanna go ahead and use template one and rather than kind of blitzing through all of the individual deals, um, I'm actually just going to hang on this one and execute all of the activities. Um, so now once we go ahead and do that, we're going to start with, we're going to start with our email um, button and kind of show off the first template. Now, uh, all of the templates, I, I, I always like to email and do my LinkedIn activity before I call. Um, I don't know how a lot of other people do, uh, do it. If anybody has any strong feelings about that in the chat, um, you know, my preferred cadence is I always like to go email LinkedIn and then call. Does anybody do anything different? Um, yep. Yeah, uh, I'm seeing some I'm seeing some interesting responses, and I think it was uh, wow. We have email direct mail. That's really interesting. Dave Perry, we got to connect after this call. I'm excited to learn about that one. Katie's got the LinkedIn. Yeah, I think the I think yeah using the using the LinkedIn and the email, in my opinion, are kind of interchangeable. Um, if you want to go if you want to go first or second, the reason I like to do it that way. Uh, the reason I actually like to do it that way is the email and then the LinkedIn and then the calls, because when I call people, um, I tend to do, I, I tend to like get paralyzed sometimes by looking at all the stuff on their LinkedIn. So I kind of want to 
like do that last. I know I will have done the first two activities. And also when I pick up the phone, I call, I say, hey, I just sent you an email and I couldn't help but notice that you've spent 20 years at your company. So you know better than anybody else about who I need to talk to. So that's just a random example, but uh, I kind of allow the other mediums to feed my talk track because if I call, I'm making it all about me, uh, which is kind of a problem that I want to avoid. So now how are we going to unstick this Jesse deal? Um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to follow the little playbook. We're going to go ahead and we're going to send Jesse an email. Now, when I go ahead, I click that email button. I'm basically just going to be able to connect my inbox and be able to start sending the emails right from here. I actually have them uh, kind of pulled up just so we could kind of talk through them. And this screen will actually probably be even easier. Um, so a lot of times when we have my conversation with Jesse, like conversation like that that went cold, um, and I also want to make sure that the font size here is good enough. This entire template uh, is available, by the way, um, on our website. You can just go to RevOps.shop. Um, you're going to be able to download all three. They're just in a Google Doc. Um, we did gate it. Um, if you have any questions about it, you feel free and ask us. But the idea is uh, I'd love to put the, the company name in the subject line. I think that tells you where you stand with your prospect. Um, when we think about these topics, like unsticking our Q4 deals, what does that really mean? I was having this conversation with Steve earlier today. What that really means is you want a response, either negative or positive, right? Why are these deals even stuck? You just want a response. Um, so I'd like to put in the company name um, because that, to me, uh, if that kind of gets open, then you kind of, that's a good signal, a good signal to call, engage people in other ways. Um, basically in this one, um, I kind of make it super, I kind of make it super innocent. Another thing that I really stand by is I generally don't like to underestimate the intelligence of our prospects. I think people have been sold to, they've been marketing to um, a long time, at least for a lot of the people that I sell to. So for me, uh, I don't kind of really waste any time with pleasantries. I just kind of say, hey, I stumbled upon this LinkedIn comment um, that's made by uh, an executive that they care about. So this email is really meant to go to your direct point of contact or your champion. This is not going around anybody. This is not going, um, you know, oh, get to power and go all the way to the top if you have, um, you know, a contact early on the sales process. The way that all these templates should be used, again, the deals are your own sticking. You've probably had a discovery call, maybe your post demo, and one of those two scenarios, prospects went dark. We've all been there hundreds of times. How do we get them to respond to us, right? At that point, it's not about we need the deal today. It's we need them to respond. And then we can try to win the deal the next day, right? That's kind of how we, we think about it. So here in this one, um, I really just love to pull, I basically just go to their company LinkedIn page. Uh, that's all I do. And then I click on, P, uh, I, go to the, I go to post and then I see what they're talking about. Um, like in this case, I really wanted to sell to Tim Gein, who is the chief commercial officer uh, at a company called USA Truck. And in this, in this case, I might say like in our previous conversations, you mentioned that your team is already working through heaps of bad data, which in turn slows down your sales cycle and negatively impacts revenue. Here they're talking about a merger and how they want to offer their customers the ability to operate from a single source. And then I kind of just ask them, like, have you ever wondered how this merger might further complicate your data and how much longer it will take your sales reps to find the right account to reach out to? Um, so this is an example. I, I think it's really big to tie it back to what the conversations were about. Um, so I have the company name. Um, yeah, where'd you, uh, perfect. All right, Steve's got everybody in the chat. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I, I think the idea is that the framework is pretty simple. Um, I love including a quote. I think it's really powerful. Um, again, just your company name in the subject line. Either they know you or they don't. Um, and if they open it and don't respond, that is a great indicator to call them a bunch of times as everybody here knows. Um, you know, and if you're not getting that information from your CRM today, you can ask me how to get that. I can help you out with that. Um, after this one, I think that's, you know, that's kind of the core basis of it. Again, feel free to steal it, modify it. I know that, so in, in our case, like, uh, um, yeah, so I think Mike Kennedy with a good question, uh, uh, engaging the prospect and then keeping them engaged. Yeah, I just think, I think that later on in the sales process, Mike, to, to specifically to answer your question, I think, and I can speak for myself, I can't speak for everybody here, but I've been hard on myself when prospects haven't responded later on 
in the sales process. And when I think about this topic of unstaking Q4 deals, it's really about getting prospects to engage after they haven't for a while, because a lot of times it might feel like, or at least I've felt like, and, and I know some other people on this webinar probably share this opinion with me that you kind of have that first interaction and if you can't really get them interested on the first interaction, that's how the deals fall into, you know, the post demo and the dead no decision and all those types of stages. So yeah, this is a way to engage people um, in the middle of the sales cycle. That is what we're looking at. Um, here's another personal favorite of mine. So I think this is something that I really learned a lot of um, at HubSpot. I have to give shout outs to um, kind of the entire HubSpot corporate team. My old manager, Rob Battaglia, they gave me a lot. Uh, they gave me a lot of this playbook, um, Dave Katz, Sam Schulman, Michelle ben Benford, et cetera. Um, this one I really like because this actually blends two templates. So we looked at identifying the deal team. Why is the deal team important? Um, ask your uh, VP of sales. Here's a challenge to everybody. You know, ask your VP of sales or the person that's managing you um, today. Those, the people that have sold to you recently, how many people on their side were there you know, that were needed in order to close the deal? Did they do it alone? Did they bring in any technical help? Did any executives talk to your executives? And I think you'd be shocked by what you find. Um, you know, nowadays, I think it's really important, um, especially because of like the macroeconomic climate. A lot of people are scared. Um, so I think the idea is like decisions are just being uh, scrutinized a lot more heavily. So I think this is why something like this is really appropriate. This one is a template that's actually going to go uh, to someone internally at your company that you think would be a good match. So I talked about Syngene in my deal preview. Now there, for example, and, and this is a kind of a real life scenario. So there, the, the VP of marketing uh, kind of has a lot of, he has a lot of questions about kind of the, the technical part of what the RevOps shop is offering to do for him. And basically, I need to, uh, and it's really their, their tech guy that's bringing up a lot of those objections and we need to get out in front of that by not having, you know, Mike, the salesperson, uh, talk to him, but actually have someone on my tech team, someone like a Steve that can help them see eye to eye level set. And the idea is I need Steve to proactively reach out to their head of tech because they're not getting back to us. So that's what this template is for. And if you sell into marketing, uh, I would reach out to maybe your VP of marketing. If you sell into sales, again, try to get your VP of sales to do that. If you're selling to operations, to purchasing, getting your chief procurement officer, your director of operations, your VP of operations, this is where you really have to get creative. I, a lot of the people that are on this webinar, I know you work for startups. I know that you don't work for a big company like HubSpot. You don't have the big brand equity, right? Kind of more or less like the RevOps shop now. So some of the things you're kind of thinking about are how do I overcome um, that kind of challenger status or like we're perceived to be lesser. And I think this is one of those ways. This is one of those ways you can really differentiate yourself, give uh, their buying team access to your selling team and your selling team should consist of people that look and feel um, like your prospects. And, and titles are an easy way to match that. Uh, so I always like to say, um, like I specify the executive sponsor, like in that case where I specified Savvy Shannon, now I would say, you know, you're probably busy, but I need your help of working on a deal with this company. Um, and this is for, you know, this is, this is the dollar amount that's at stake. We're trying to get this closed ASAP. Um, uh, but my main, you know, point of contact or champion stopped answering my emails or my outreach has stalled. So my hope is to have you send them an, an executive outreach email, um, to, and again, here's the idea to that person. They are their, you know, COO. And I actually wrote you a draft version of the email. Let me know if you can accommodate this request and if there's anything I can do to make it happen. And under here, I have kind of dashes. And then I say, here's me actually writing the email. So you're going to actually write the email uh, for your executives using this template. Because think about it. They're busy. They're trying to bring in your contract. They, they have a lot of work on their plate, whatever the case may be. Um, they're trying to buy raw materials. If, again, if they're in purchasing operations, they're probably worried about the supply chain shortage. They're worried, worried about things like lead time. So you're going to go ahead and you're going to say, hey, uh, you know, uh, this is, you know, I'm the, I'm the COO of the RevOps shop. It's great to connect with you. Or I'm the head of tech, right? I'm the CTO. It's my understanding that 
your team wants to use us to get rid of, you know, bad CRM data, that's slowing down your sales cycles. That's preventing account managers from treating your customers like family from the first call. We know that making a choice for a data cleanup vendor is a really tough and, and challenging one. So I'd be happy to connect and answer any questions you may have. Um, please let me know a convenient time and we look forward to partnering with you. Um, so I think the, the executives cut through uh, kind of a lot of nonsense. Maybe just, you know, if you've used exec, if you've never used an executive on any of your deals, maybe just, you know, type something in the chat, maybe like two. And then if you have type in one, um, that could be another good one. Um, yeah, so it looks like a lot of people are are pulling these people in and and i think i really just would encourage you to probably not a question fit for a webinar but challenge yourself look inward and say how many times have i actually done this out of all of the deals that i've successfully sold or or on or all of the deals that i've successfully lost right that might be an even more impactful one um did i use an executive on all of them and the answer if the answer is no um I had this proven to me kind of the hard way in, in my past life. Like I'm, I'm leaving money on the table and so are you. So and we all, we all know how much salespeople love that. Um, so that's, the, that's the second one. Uh, you'll be able to just go ahead and grab this one. I think that that one's going to have a lot of impact for people on the webinar, just because a few of you are answering that, Hey, we've never, you know, we, we haven't even done this before. So I think that that's going to be a big win. Um, this one is probably, this one is probably like, uh, a lot of times, you know, you might have a situation where you feel like you've done everything you absolutely can. Um, you, you feel like you've done everything you absolutely can and you kind of feel like the deal is kind of coming to a head. And why is it kind of, when we say it's stuck, it's kind of like maybe you feel like your champion or your, your um, POC has given you everything you want to hear. You've had, you know, you've had the happy years and they've kind of fed them and they've told you, hey, yeah, absolutely. We're going to make this happen. We're going to have a meeting on this date. I'm going to introduce you to the decision maker. We're going to talk about what it's like to get this project approved. And they, everything sounds great. And then, you know, they'll cancel the meeting like the day before. And then you're kind of, you send them an email and you're saying, hey, should we reschedule? They never get back to you. And you kind of don't think much of it because the minutia of the day-to-day -day just kind of, you know, eats at you and you're doing other things. Um, and then next thing you know, this is a deal that's kind of lapsed. This is a deal that you at first thought sounded good. Maybe you've even had multiple conversations um, with your main point of contact. I think this is where you're going to need almost like a little bit of a kind of like a forcing function. Like, I think that this is, there's all, there's two different, there's a lot, lots of different styles in sales. And I think that we've, you know, if you've been on LinkedIn, if you've been consuming a lot of the content that that's kind of prevalent in the sales community, I think there's, I've always kind of thought about it in two schools of thought. I think there's people that um, kind of have a little bit of confidence be behind their, their product they're offering themselves. And there's people that don't, um, you're not bothering your prospects. I think that's also another thing like people ignore emails, they ignore your communications for all sorts of crazy reasons. And unless, you know, anything can happen, sometimes maybe messages aren't getting delivered. They aren't getting through. Maybe you suspect that's happening. Maybe you feel like they're just ignoring you. Uh, even with all the sales tech that we have out there nowadays, uh, I think the idea is sometimes you just need to put exactly what you're thinking of and you need to kind of state your intentions um, in an email. This is something that has worked for me in the past. Um, so basically here, I'll just say, again, I'm using my company name because I want to know where I stand. And this one, this one is really, I think there's two variations of this template. One that can go to your, uh, one that could go to your champion or kind of your point of contact that you're working with in a sales process, like the person that's been your best friend, or you can go ahead um, and actually send this above them to somebody else that you know has like evaluated a project. I think this example is probably a little bit more discovery dependent, but I still really like the template. I like a lot of the language. So here I'll just kind of say like, this is Mike and I'm the sales rep working with Jim on improving, you know, your company's bad data. You're likely aware that this problem is slowing down your sales cycles and reducing the productivity of your sales reps. Chances are your team is laser focused on bringing in your biggest deals to finish the year strong. Um, that's another kind of nugget I like because I think it shows some emotional intelligence that, you know, at the end of the year, when you think about Q4, right, a seasonal aspect of it is it's not only you trying to sell your deals, they're trying to sell theirs. And when you think about their resources, their legal team, right, if you were leading that business, what contracts would you want them focused on? Um, so it's easy to understand that, you know, again, you can't really take this stuff personally. Sometimes you just need to reach out. Um, with a lot of these emails. And I will basically go ahead and say, 
I'm sure you can appreciate we're trying to do the same. And based on my conversations with Jim, like here, here are your biggest concerns. Like you don't, and I like to just call out the objections. Even if I've never spoken to this person, I'd rather guess and get it wrong because then I know I'm getting a response and then I at least have the opportunity for a conversation. Whereas right now I'm sitting in, in nobody's land, right? Uh, so, so I will go ahead and say, um, you don't know how your team will be supported. You aren't sure if our HubSpot integration works. Something else we haven't talked about. Like there might just be something I'm completely missing. And then I'm saying, this one, I actually like to buck the trend a little bit with the calendar invites and meeting invites. I'll say, to remove the pain of scheduling and to keep your calendar open, I'll give you a call at one on Tuesday to talk through to you above. It'll take 10 minutes. If my timing is perfect, no need to respond. I'll just call at one on Tuesday. And the idea is you actually should call on Tuesday. And of course, if they can't take that call on Tuesday, everybody here knows how quickly will the prospects respond and tell you that they can't make that time, right? And then the, the idea is the response is the time to call, right? And that's going to happen right away. Um, and again, I know that this is not going to suit everybody's style just to give you something to play with. This is one that um, I like and I kind of save it in my desperation moments. I've even kind of named it force a response and that's one that, that you can use leverage and, and kind of tweak to your liking. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I think the I think the uh, other bit that I just uh, kind of wanted to talk through, like I, I didn't have the uh, email integration connected, but let's just pretend that we had went ahead and sent one of those emails. Uh, the next thing that we're going to want to do, right? Uh, call and call and LinkedIn kind of all at the same time. So again, I've got AirCall connected to HubSpot. Um, why do I like this? Because you can see it. I'm doing I'm doing it all in my browser. Um, it's calling off of Mike's air, line, air call line. We're actually going to go ahead and call Jesse. Um, so we'll see. We'll see if he answers. And here we can see, like, here's all the information. Hey, Jesse, this is Mike. I'm calling to fix your data, and I feel like we should have a conversation as soon as possible. Give me a call. Thanks. Now, Jesse's my friend. Hopefully, he's not going to get too upset uh, about me leaving him that voicemail. Does anybody here leave fun voicemails for their friends? Um, type yes in the chat if so. Or, or maybe tell us a about a fun voicemail you've left a prospect. Um, that could be another good one uh, if any brave souls want to share. Maybe at the end, I'll share one of mine. Um, I know Steve is sweating now. Um, so, yeah, here, I'm going to go ahead and put in the quality of the call. Boom, that's it. It's logged. Um, now it's going to sit inside of my timeline. And after this, I could just go ahead, click complete, go to the next task. Um, and that's it. So this is how I'll kind of rotisserie through a few of my deals. Um, and I'll be able to actually, again, plug in my deal team, plug in um, all of these deals that I know are supposed to come in in the future. I could go ahead and leverage my templates. Um, Cal with a great anecdote. Um, I think we've all been there. Uh, trying to erase our voicemails. Um, so yeah, I think I think the that pretty much the idea is you work through your deals in this in this fashion. Um, you now have three uh, kind of great templates that you can use at any time. Um, just kind of moving through the recap and segueing over now. Just trying to be conscious of the time because it's 2:42. I do want to leave some time for questions and maybe just talk through um, you know some of the either some of the deals you have templates you may be sending anything is fair game. Um, to have a great Q4, um, you need to see everybody that you've kind of talked to um, that you think has a remote chance of closing in the next six months, uh, the, the internal team members that are involved and your time-based next step. Like I put in that next step for Jesse. I want to make sure I get that task completed by tomorrow. Um, again, I just think the same thing as that third email template that we just went through. Um, if you say you're going to call at one, you should call at one um, because if those people don't answer, um, you know, you, you put that message out there and you go ahead and you call and you say, Hey, I sent you an email telling you I'm calling you at once. So here I am. Um, and then after that, I think, uh, the idea around the templates themselves and kind of the outreach, right. So that you don't appear desperate, um, kind of the, uh, the, uh, the, I think the first, the second one, right. The acknowledge that their contracts are taking priority right now. Um, but that it will only like get crazier. That one is kind of like the. Uh, kind of the third email that I showed. And then after that, it's, you know, connect the CEOs or company social posts to something in your conversation, tie it back to the value of your product, try and think about aha moments um, when their faces are on zoom and they're lighting up a little and, you know, you see something, or, you know, or they're really paying attention. They're really tuned in. 
Um, I think those are going to be really important moments to kind of tie that social activity back to when they're reaching out and not just saying, hey, uh, you know, we're doing 20% off because it's the end of the quarter and, you know, being like every other salesperson, every other email. Don't get me wrong. There's a time and place for those, but I think it's still too early for that. And you still have the opportunity um, to use this. Um, pick an executive on your team. That will be a great one-to-one -one match. Uh, again, really underused, under leveraged, underutilized. I think every executive team in America right now is going to want to participate um, in closing deals. So use that one with confidence for sure. And I think the big one there is uh, make it easy. Uh, make it easy on your executives. Make it easy on them to participate. And then uh, use the right tech for the job. Uh, you saw it was pretty easy with me, uh, with, for me with HubSpot, CRM, the air call, phone solution. Um, we kind of plugged all that stuff together. You know, if you want something that looks like that, you're on this call. Um, feel, you know where to find us. Um, and yeah, I think now we can probably move to Q&A. Um, you could go ahead and get those templates just by heading over to our website. Um, again, I want to thank AirCall and Sales Hacker for the opportunity. If you guys have questions, uh, if anybody in the chat has questions, please just feel free to send them my way um, or find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm going to pause the share now. Um, uh, so Dave Perry asking about the best first email. Um, that's a, that Dave, that's a great question. I think I'll probably, Dave, if you can connect with me on LinkedIn specifically for that one, just because I want to take a look at your industry and figure out if it's even worth um, sending that example to you. Um, yeah. Um, perfect. Um, Andrew's got great, Andrew's got a great example with the hey name. Have you given up on this project? Um, I've actually seen a lot of variations on LinkedIn recently. I don't know if everybody else has. I've seen people just uh, kind of with a bump style, right? So after you have that, uh, and I think Andrew, actually, you bring up a great, you brought up a great point there. After you send any of the templates that I showed you today, there's absolutely no harm and no foul. And actually it's recommended to do exactly what Andrew's saying. So either have you given up on this project thoughts? I saw another one on a LinkedIn post a few days ago that I'm really excited to try was just like using the prospect's first names. So like it would be like Michael question mark. Um, yeah, uh, I think, uh, uh, Sadman's got a good question. What are your thoughts on being more concise for the first touch point email as opposed to throwing in tons of data? Yeah, I think, I think the, I think the reason we write a short email is because we want to make sure that it kind of gets read and consumed. Um, I think the, in our case, uh, like all the templates we went through, none of those are first emails, right? But if we are talking, if we're just talking about, uh, general prospecting and you're talking about people that you haven't had a conversation with. Um, I'm a really, really big fan of short emails. Um, I just say, uh, I think the first line is why I reached out to a person specifically too, is how I helped someone that maybe looks and feels like them either on the company or on, on the personal level. Um, and then the third line will just be like asking them if they're open to a conversation. That's all. But I'm, I'm a really big fan of short emails because I think they have to be consumed on mobile and the LinkedIn feed and et cetera, et cetera. Like I just, so good, good question. Yeah, and keep them coming. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Gretchen, that's, that's a good one. At a minimum, what your company does. Yeah, um, that's kind of the, the, I try to work that into pretty much the, the second line. Um, when I say, here's how we helped another similar company, right? So that I'll just say something like, we just helped a similar, you know, FinTech, um, increase the number of disbursements through its digital platform, you know, to 40 million from 25 million, you know, are you open to learning about how we did it? Um, that's, that's kind of how, and, and I like to frame it in terms of, uh, a benefit they'd achieve. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, Cal's got a, uh, Cal's got a question, um, length of email and amount of resources. I actually think, uh, people despise links oftentimes, even when you, even when they ask for them, a lot of times they don't end up clicking them. I'm a big fan of just breaking it down, um, for them in the email. Uh, I, I think, you know, I'm trying to make sense of the actual question, like a structured template. The only template that I, I think is really rigid for me is the one when a person asks for a recap and I think they're going to 
like buy. I think they have a good chance. I, I think it's, they're a really strong candidate um, or, or their company is a really, really good fit. That's when I do have kind of like a long summary email that details basically, you know, terms of engagement, here's the pricing uh, all the way at the top. And I, I could share something like that too, if people would be um, interested. But the first section just recaps why and how it's going to impact their business. The second one is what is the contract length and what are the terms and what do they get, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, filled with line items. Um, and then after that, I basically outline the next steps. So I do have a template like that. Um, and Cal, I'm happy to share that. Um, if you want to just ping me on LinkedIn, uh, we'll do that right now. And I'm sure Steve will remind me too. Yeah, I think uh, Andrew's got a really good question. Um, the reason why, and, and I realize I may have glossed over this, the reason why I included the template where you write the email for the executives is because that's how you teach them about what's driving the deal. Um, another, but you do bring up a good point because sometimes there are additional nuances other than just why are they buying? A lot of times, as we all know on this call, the most important things to know in a deal are, are who are your biggest detractors and who's going to cause you not to buy. So anytime there are conflicting egos, conflicting personalities, conflicting priorities within an account, I think that's something that you might want to um, put into the top of that email, Andrew. I think some variation of that top section of the second template that I showed that, of course, you can get and download on our website. I think some variation of that where you're just putting in a little blurb that says, here are the power players uh, in the account. Here's the, here's the person who I think is signing the check. Here's the person who I think, who I know is leading the evaluation and the project. And then here's the person that I think is secretly going to have an issue with us. And here's what I think their fear is. Uh, that's going to be a good one. Um, I'm just going to um, abstain on the Daniel question. Oh, that's my little brother. Yes, I have sent out a calendar invite uh, without an email prior after seeing lots of opens. Um, uh, uh, Luda is asking us a really good question, a really hot topic. How many times, um, you know, I think on this call we have uh, Savannah, she's hosting our webinar. She probably gets a lot of different emails from salespeople. And for, for people here that, that don't know Luda, you can uh, definitely go ahead and connect with her on LinkedIn. I highly recommend that because there's a lot of sales talent um, in, in this webinar and, and Luda's a, a recruiter and she actually helped me get started in my career too. Um, we like to send a lot of emails before giving up. I mean, a lot of the sequences that or, or kind of cadences, whichever tool, whichever language you're used to using that Steve and I are configuring nowadays, we're dripping people 10, 11, 12 times. Um, 10, 11, 12 times is how many times we're emailing people. That's not factoring in the calls. That's not factoring in the LinkedIn touches. Uh, we're seeing that it takes more and more uh, to get people uh, to get people back on the phone and to get them re-engaged. And a lot of times people just miss things. You'd be surprised. They miss six, seven emails in a row. Um, so the answer to that question is, if it's a big enough deal, I'll try 40 times. Um, you know, and the last email try is I think Nap Andrew Napoli gave us a really, really, really good uh, example. It's like, have you given up on this project? And I guess Luda, in your case, that would probably be, hey, are you, you know, are you still in the market? Um, yeah. So here, yeah, Gretchen, I think that that's a great call out. Uh, if you want to go ahead, drop your source. I'm, I'm all, uh, I'm all about learning. I think everybody else here is. Um, uh, I think, uh, I think, uh, to, to Daniel's question, when are discounts appropriate? Um, I, I sent a, a great deal of those in the past, um, working, um, at a big software company now that, you know, we have a services company and it's a little bit different. We can't really discount because we're just discounting our hours. So I'm almost kind of happy that I'm not sending those anymore. Um, but when is a discount appropriate? I think a discount is appropriate when, I think there's a fundamental mismatch between how your company prices and how uh, you know the customer is going to use um, the product in real time. So, you know, a lot of times, again, it's easier, like a, a, I'm trying to think of an example that isn't software because I'm weary of, 
of using all those. Uh, I'm, I'm weary of using that every time. Uh, maybe an example might be something like uh, if you're trying to uh, regulate temperature um, inside of a warehouse and you might have different types of things that need to be cooled. So you have the interior space, maybe you have some sort of storage tanks that need to be cooled. And maybe the module that the company sells is geared for both like use cases, but can be used for one. So you only have one pricing model and you know, you know that your customer is only going to use it one way. I think that might be a good scenario um, where you might want to leverage a discount. And of course, in the software example, it will be things like if your company asks for a minimum number of users uh, for a specific, you know, functionality, um, and that comes at a certain price. I think when 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 you sense some apprehension from the prospect, and and even if you don't sense it, uh, just calling it out um, proactively, kind of like how we do with that third template, I think could be a good one. Um, I think uh, digital selling requires special personalization. Mike, that's a great question. I would love for Steve, I'm going to put him on the spot. I would love for him to turn on his video um, and show you what he's got. Um, he's got, a, I don't even know if he's by the computer anymore. We'll hope that, that he can join us because we actually used, uh, look up a tool called warmly.ai. I'm actually going to drop this in the chat for everybody. Uh, this has been making its rounds. It's a Zoom app. Um, yeah, Steve's kind of putting it on. Everybody see he's got the name tag. Um, he's got uh, the RevOps shop icon. He's got the location. Um, I think in the beginning of the pandemic uh, with the virtual and digital selling, Mike, a lot of what I was doing, I would always replace my background with the company logo or the front of the company's headquarters that I was selling to. And that would always be a great like digital icebreaker. That would always be an amazing one. Uh, it always got people talking um, on the Zoom. That's once you, once you get them to show up to uh, the appointment. Um, and then again, when you talk about like with the, and warmly, uh, another good example of that, I think people get curious, they like it. We were kind of bummed when it didn't work for me because I did the hosting. But if you're talking more about um, prospecting and reaching out to, to people individually, I actually, I stay away from a lot of the heavy personalization with initial outreach because I feel like prospects can see through a lot of the noise, right? They, they understand that they're being sold to. Um, I, I think I've been lately subscribing more and more to relevance is more important than personalization. So rather than saying, I see you went to this school or we have this in common, or I saw this listed, like I saw this interest listed on your profile, or we both have this skill, just kind of, again, jumping off of LinkedIn. I really like to use, you know, and it's been popularized by a lot of people. I don't even know who to give credit to, but it's the why you, why now? And I just kind of say that, you know, it might be like uh, marketing directors or VP of sales or, you know, struggling with tool fatigue. They have too many tools to choose from. They don't really know how to connect all of them properly and they need some help. And that's why I think you might benefit from a conversation, right? So it's specialized or, or personalized to kind of the business reason, um, the value behind it, as opposed to we both share this in common, you know, and I think that's kind of what I've been leaning on, at least on a wider scale. Um, if, if something else. Yeah. Um, I, I want to address the, I want to address the, the Dan question. Um, there's no, um, I, there's never a bad time to really be prospecting. People are always buying. Um, yeah, why now? Why you? Why now? Subject line that's solid. Um, there, hold on. Yeah, uh, Daryl, recording will be available. Uh, we'll be able to get that to you. Um, to Dan's question, um, if you're starting right now, uh, don't worry about it being Q4. All of that is, uh, to be cliche, completely out of your control. People are still going to need uh, the solution that you're selling. There's still going to be some people that are in market. Um, I think uh, a great uh, way to, to make yourself feel comfortable is just really asking people about their plans for next year. Just, you know, find the broader category that you're in. So if you're in any type of competitive intelligence, if you're in research, I think maybe it'll just be like, when's the last time, you know, you did a meaningful com competitive analysis, right? When's the last time you really benchmarked your product? against that of your competitors. You know, would you would you be open to doing that before 
we got into next year so that you could figure out how to really hit the ground running. I think I'd be focusing on a lot of that messaging, right? Like letting people know that uh, maybe even acknowledging it, it's like, hey, uh, not too, you know, you're probably not thinking about too many grandiose projects. You're probably thinking about just wrapping up this year, but what would be the worst thing that happened if we talked about what competitive intelligence or research might look like next year? Um, I think those would be some of the tips to, to start conversations and don't force your timeline on your prospect. That's another thing. Um, you know, I, I rather prefer, I, I like to find people that want to buy as opposed to convince people that I think will never buy, that they should buy tomorrow. Um, I see there's a lot more questions. 